for the life-giving water of baptism, now pouring in the spirit of the new creation. Wash away our sins. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hold together all things in heaven and on earth. In your great mercy, receive the prayers of all your children and give to all the world the spirit of your truth and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, 
for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated, but in your hearts sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear, so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him or nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. For those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. <clears throat> the text for my sermon this morning comes from the Gospel, talking about the love of God for all of us. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. They who, ha they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. I'd like to begin with a short story this morning. In the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific, some villagers practice a unique form of logging. If a tree is too large to be felled with an ax, the natives cut it down by yelling at it. Woodsmen with special powers creep up on a tree just at dawn and suddenly scream at it at the top of their lungs. They continue this for 30 days. The tree dies and falls over. The theory is that the hollering kills the spirit of the tree. And according to the villagers, it always works. Ah, those poor, naive innocents, such quaintly charming habits of the jungle. Screaming at trees, indeed, how primitive. Too bad they don't have the advantages of modern technology and the scientific mind. Me, I yell at my wife and yell at the telephone and the lawnmower and yell at the TV and the newspaper and my children. I've even been made known to shake my fist and to yell at the sky from time to time. The man next door yells at his car a lot, and this summer I heard him yell at a stepladder for most of an afternoon. We modern, educated folks yell at traffic and umpires and bills and banks and machines, especially machines. Machines and relatives get the most yelling. Don't know what good it does. Machines and things just sit there. Even kicking doesn't always help. As for people, well, the Solomon Islanders may have a point. Yelling at living things does tend to kill the spirit in them. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will break our hearts. Who do you yell at? Come on, fess up. I think even the most meek and mild manner of us yell at somebody sometime, don't we? I know I yell at my wife from time to time, but we've been married long enough now that she doesn't listen to me anymore. Which is good for me, then I don't gotta grovel and ask for forgiveness in those silent periods, remember those? <clears throat> But I think all of us at some time or another has yelled at somebody. And we find out that when we do that, we build a wall to, with them rather than building bridges to connect with them and have relationships to keep us together. <clears throat> I think there's something about our human nature that allows us to yell at somebody, and especially those people that are closest to us that we really don't want to hurt in the beginning. We have that little human nature within us. <clears throat> And when we yell at somebody, we know the hurt that happens and the things that happen. Paul knew this about our human nature. He said, I'm one time a saint, but I'm also at the same time a sinner. The things I know I should do are the things I don't do. And the things that I know are evil and I shouldn't do, somehow those are the things that we do. Within each of us is that little defiant spirit that sometimes just wants to lash out and wants to hurt somebody. 
Today we hear in our gospel that this is not God's way with us. His way with us has always been love, has always been reconciliation and unity and oneness. And he has called on us through our baptism to reach out and to continue his ministry of reaching out to one another in love. Whenever they talk about the love of God in scripture, they usually use adjectives such as God's abundant love or his steadfast love for all of us. This morning, I'd like if you could help me for a little bit and try to imagine that you're God. Okay, now I know for some of us that might be easy, that a role we like to play uh, from time to time. But for others, it might be a little bit more difficult, but try to imagine that you are God. And here you created this wonderful universe and people who are the best people you're able to create. And all of a sudden you look over their shoulder and there they are, fighting with one another, backbiting, killing each other off. If you were God at that point, what would you do? Well, God says, if they don't know how to live together in love and harmony, maybe if I send them my laws, they'll know how to treat each other with dignity. And so we have the record of the Old Testament, how God sent them the Ten Commandments. And how did the people respond? They went on worshiping their own golden calf. If you were God at that point, what would you do? Well, God says, <clears throat> I am their God and they are my people and I will never abandon them. If they won't listen to my laws, maybe they'll listen to my ambassadors. And so he sent his prophets among them to show them a new way of living, a new way of loving one another. But again, we have the record of the Old Testament, how people picked up stones and chased the prophets out of their midst. If you were God at that point, what would you do? Well, God says, you are my people and I am your God and my love for you will never end. I could let the world to its own destruction, but that wouldn't be good because I am your God. And so if they won't listen to my law or to my prophets, maybe they'll listen to me if I come down among them and show them by my lifestyle and by my words, just how they are to love and treat one another. And so we have the record of that Christmas Eve, how God came down among us in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And by Christ's words and actions and lifestyle, he showed us exactly how it is to be with us and how we are to love one another. But once again, the people bore their ugly teeth and they nailed him fast to the cross. If you were God at that point, that might've been the last straw you said, I'll let the world to its own destruction and I'll go somewhere else. But God says, you are my people and I am your God and my love for you will never end. I will send my spirit among you. But those of you who believe that I have become part of your life and entered into your life, I will be your God and give you a relationship with me that not even death can destroy. Well, this morning, we are the modern recipients of that spirit in our baptism God called each of us by name and adopted us as his children and given us the promise that he will go with us from now and forever. He says that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. <clears throat> Excuse me. God has called each of us and given us his spirit that we may be his presence of love now within the world and that we might be him. Paul says because of his baptism, we are now the salt and the light in the midst of life. We are a new creation. He has claimed us as his children and given us his spirit. I don't know if you ever thought about your life as being salt or light or not, but think about it for a moment. As I told somebody this morning, I grew up in the south side of Easton and uh, my mother was a wonderful cook and baker. And so when it came time to go to college, I didn't want to leave that. <laughs> So I decided I would commute to Lafayette, and that's what I did. That, that served me well for four years. I got great meals and great, great goods, and I was a happy camper. But then, after four years, I graduated and had to go to Philadelphia to seminary. Well, my first couple of days down at the seminary, I found out that the cafeteria was not that great. <clears throat> And I tried local places around to eat, but they were terrible too. And then I remembered that my mother used to make a great vegetable soup. Anybody make vegetable soup here? You know what a miracle soup it is. You can make it on a Sunday, and that darn thing will last right on through Friday, right? In fact, that seems to multiply a little bit. 
But the miracle is that each day it gets better. I don't know if all the flavors melt together or what, but, but when Friday comes around and you've had the last bowl, you're kind of sad that it's over. Well, I thought to myself, I can do that. And so I put together a nice pot of vegetable soup, had nice color to it, looked nice, smell wasn't that great, but that, that was okay. And then I tasted it, it was terrible, it was yucky. And then I discovered an ingredient which most doctors frown on today, but I know God knew what he was doing when he created salt. <laughs> and so I'd take a huge pinch of salt and put it in the soup, and all of a sudden it had life, it had zest. God is saying to each of us this morning, in a world which is kind of flat and has lost its taste and zest for life, because he has given us his spirit and acted in our life, we can do that to the world also. Growing up, I have a brother. Uh, he's three years younger than I am, but he's always bigger than me, a big kid. And he used to delight in locking me in the closet because he knew I hated the darkness. Well, for some reason, he became a Presbyterian minister. We don't quite know how that happened yet. <laughs> but I remember after days of fighting to stay out of the closet, I decided that Lutheran brains can overcome Presbyterian brawn. <laughs> and what I would do is take a flashlight and hide it in the closet. And when he locked me in, I could kind of turn it on and know the direction and security that a beam of light can give. In a world today which is full of darkness, because he has given us his spirit and entered our life, we can do that to the world. We can give it direction. We can give it security. We can be the light of Christ to all those around us. You are the light and the salt in the midst of life because of your baptism. And where does God want us to be the light and the salt in the midst of life? He says, right where you are. I don't know if you remember the old 70s, oh, you're not that old yet. But, but in the 70s, there's a wonderful bumper stick which said, bloom where you're planted. And that's what God wants us to do, to be his presence where you are, whether it be the family in which you live, this congregation of which you're a member, the place where you work or recreate or the school that you go to, there God expects us to be the salt and the light in the midst of life because he has given us his spirit. And it's not hard to do. Uh, I'd like to give you an example of what discipleship may mean for us today. This is an interview between a sociologist and, and three women. Now, it's a little bit dated. It was written in the 50s, so... Uh, You'll have to take that into consideration as I read it. The leader said, suppose it is one of those mornings when everything seems to go wrong. The telephone rings, the baby cries, and before you know it, the toast is burned. Your husband looking over the toaster says, my God, when will you ever learn to make toast? What's your reaction? Well, Mrs. A said, I'd probably throw the toast in his face. Mrs. B said, I would say, fix your own blank toast. And Mrs. C said, I'd be so hurt that I would only cry. And the leader said, and what would your husband's words make you feel toward him? They all said, anger, hate, and resentment. And the leader said, it would be easy for you to fix another batch of toast. Mrs. A said, only if I could put some poison in it first. And the leader said, and when he left for work, would it be easy for you to go about your day? They all said, no, the whole day would be ruined. Now the leader said, suppose that the situation is the same. The toast is burnt, but your husband looking over the situation says, gee, honey, it's been a rough morning for you, the baby, the phone, and now the toast. What would be your reaction? Well, Mrs. A said, I'd probably drop dead if my husband said that to me. <laughs> Mrs. B said, I'd feel wonderful. And Mrs. C said, I feel so good that I would hug him and kiss him. And the leader said, why? That baby is still crying and the toast is still burnt. They all said that wouldn't matter. You'd feel kind of grateful that he didn't criticize you, that he was with you and not against you. This is such a very simple slice of life, but how many times through a day do opportunities like this come before us? When either with a word we can build somebody up in love or with another word we can tear them down and destroy them. We do have that choice and we do have that power over one another. We can be God's disciples of love in this world simply by our actions one to the other. And certainly that's 
very much needed today. Today, we need to see our lives and our destiny as part of God's plan for this world. We can be his presence to those around us. There's a story about a little kindergarten girl downstairs after church, her grandfather was going to get down and pick her up uh, and take her home with him. And as he got downstairs, he happened to notice that she is drawing something. And so he goes over and asks her, so, what are you drawing here? Well, she says, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, the grandfather says, nobody knows what God's look like. Well, she said enthusiastically, they will when I'm finished. <laughs> My hope for all of us is that when our life is finished also, people close to us and around us will have a better idea of what God looks like because of our life, because of our words and our actions and our lifestyle. We can become the presence of God to those around us. God today calls us discipleship, and he asks us now to engage one another in those acts of love, that we may be part of his kingdom. Today, our gospel says to each of us and challenges each of us, if you love me, you will keep my command. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Amen.
Let us proclaim our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, and the of heaven. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God, our faithful companion, you promised to never leave us and to send us your spirit to guide us in the wisdom and truth. Send your people into the world to serve as mirrors that reflect and magnify your love. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the earth sings praises to you. Grant your care to the creatures, plants, and places that are suffering, and equip us to respond to their song. Make us agents of restoration and refreshment for all your beloved creation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You call all people of the world your children. Judge the nations just, justly. Show mercy to all who are oppressed and speak truth to power through your prophets. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Nurturing God, you sent your spirit to grant us peace. Make your presence known to those who feel abandoned or alone and to all who are sick or grieving. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You hold us in your loving care. We pray for mothers and mother figures. Console all who long to be mothers, children estranged from their mothers, anyone grieving the death of a mother, and mothers who have lost a child. Support all for whom this day is difficult. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You provide all that we need, dear God. Thank you for all the gifts brought this day to feed those who are in need. Thank you for the caring way this congregation responds to their need. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Almighty God, you give life and breath to all things. We give thanks for the Apostle Matthias and all your saints. Sustain us by your love until we join the saints in glory. Hear us, O oh God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The priest of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. You have raised us to new life in Christ. Give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. We praise you for creating the heavens and the earth. We bless you for bringing Noah and his family through the waters of the flood, for freeing your people, Israel, from the bonds of slavery, and for sending your son to be our redeemer. We give you thanks for Jesus, who living among us, healed the sick, fed the hungry, and with a love stronger than death, gave his life for others. In the night in which you, <coughs> excuse me, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of din. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his life-giving death and glorious resurrection, we await your promised life for all the dying world. Breathe your spirit on us and on this bread and cup. <clears throat> Carry us in your arms from death to life that we may live as your chosen ones, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. To him, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and know Christ, broken and poured out for us.
blood of Christ shed for you. body of Christ given for you. Just a drink. Blood of Christ shed for you.
The congregation will stand. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. First, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor George Zaccarda for sharing your gifts with us today. It was truly a blessing to have you with us. Thank you. Well, I have two pages, but it's not a lot, really. <laughs> Some very good news. The state has accepted and approved the merger of St. John's Windish, St. Peter's, and Light of Christ, with a little help from Lisa Boscola's office, um, to expedite the uh, application through the Corporation Bureau. So we are now official. <laughs> Bank accounts are in the process of being set up, so everything is moving along. Uh, the DVDs from St. John's Windish and St. Peter's Final Worships have been ordered, and they will be available on May 28th at the Final Worship of Light of Christ. Speaking of which, please sign up for the luncheon and for the DVDs for the Final Worship of Light of Christ that's available in the narthex. The closing sale, for the sale, sorry, the closing for the sale to Lehigh, it's an ongoing process. It will begin this week, <laughs> and it will continue next week and conclude on May 23rd. So by the time we come back here, we'll almost be done, but not quite. Um, your keys will continue to work at St. John's and St. Peter's until the 23rd at least. Moving companies are continuing to um, pack and remove and store items from both St. John's and St. Peter's. We have received the cost estimates for the property on Linden Street that was of interest to the Relocation Committee and the Council. At this time, the cost for purchase, repairs, and remodeling exceed budgeted expectations. So we're going to kind of put that on the back burner. The Relocation Committee and Council are continuing to explore other options, including buildings, which may be for sale, and talks with existing congregations in regard to acquiring property use. The Call Committee will be meeting with the Council on Tuesday evening to complete the Ministry Site Profile, which is the next step in the call process. Now for Council updates. The council was joined by Pastor Dan Bertel and Pastor Otto Dry uh, Doppler. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Everyone knows him, so I, I, luckily we can call him Pastor Otto because the last name befuddles me. Anyway, Pastor Dan's role will be to attend council meetings, hospital and crisis situations, pastoral counseling, premarital counseling, and to preside at weddings and funerals. Pastor Otto's role will be to preach and preside over the Eucharist 
and to perform baptisms. The good news is that Pastor Otto has agreed to be with us every Sunday as long as we need him. So beginning May 28th, he will be here every Sunday except for when he's on vacation. The cell numbers for both of those gentlemen will be in the Till We Meet Again. Um, the mission statement, which was created with congregational input, was approved at the council meeting. The property team will assist with additional moving that is required and will install a new outdoor sign for Blessed Trinity. And it was agreed by the council and both pastors present that the June congregational meeting is not necessary this year since we are just in the reorganization stages. I hesitate to do this, but does anyone have any questions? <laughs> oh, okay, very good, thank you. <laughs>